All right, and everybody, welcome to uh, the panel today uh, for Embedded Systems Scaling Device Metrics. Uh, I am going to be your moderator, Jordan Schvel. We are logging in right now, going to get all of my panelists up and on video so we can say hi to everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we do have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so some of the things that I do want to mention is that we're going to save some time at the end to answer audience questions. Uh, so those are questions you can submit anytime, uh, as well as uh, throughout the, the presentation and discussion. Um, and if at any point you have questions, click the Q&A button at the very bottom uh, of the screen. You're going to see an icon. Click that, uh, type in your question, and hit send. Um, so again, some of the questions are going to get answered as we go along, but go ahead and feel free to, to put those in. Anything that doesn't get answered during the discussion will be answered at the end. Uh, and anything that we really run out of time on, we're going to post in the uh, Slack for the, mem uh, the Interrupt Community Slack. Uh, so make sure we're going to send some uh, post in the notes to uh, get you guys on there. So let us know if you have any questions. Um, and this all session is going to be recorded. So if you want to share it with colleagues, review it later. You guys are going to get a link right afterwards in your email. Um, and that is it for housekeeping. So on to metrics, uh, the topic for today. Uh, so Phil, I'd love to you know, get you uh, voicing in and chime in to, to help us get started. Um, you know, We're going to be talking about devices and metrics. And one of the things that I've learned in my career is that words like devices and metrics mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, so before we jump in, uh, Phil, can you help me set the stage a little bit? Uh, before we tell everyone why metrics are so important uh, and what to do with them, what are metrics? Can you give us maybe a really quick uh, insight to kick us off on, on what metrics are? And then we'll go ahead and uh, introduce the panel, talk through the agenda and, and get started. Sure thing. So it's metric is certainly one of those overloaded words. And the way I define it, and I hope my, my panelists agree, is Sorry, I think I missed. Um, Phil, I don't can you guys hear Phil? I can hear. All right. Okay. <laughs> so a metric, as I define it, is any quantifiable measurement that we can make about a system or a process to um, gain insight into how it's performing. Um, you know, unlike logs or crash reports, which are often text-based, metrics are just numbers that we're, um, you know, collecting usually in some kind of key value way. We have an identifier and a number, and we're collecting them and reporting them over time. So for hardware devices, these might be, you know, measurements like boot time, number of crashes that are occurring in a day, um, how many miniature connected to Wi-Fi in an hour, your average power consumption, things like that. We're having some Zoom difficulty. Jordan can apparently not hear Philip, but he'll restart after this. But um, awesome. uh, so, Phil, I appreciate you getting this kicked off, um, and I am going to reset my Zoom while we're going uh, so that I can hear you next time. Um, but to get us kicked off, so you know, we're going to talk through a lot of different topics today. We've got some great questions lined up. I think we're going to get some really good conversation going around metrics and, and how to leverage them a little bit better. Um, but first, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Uh, so Shiva, Tyler, Phil, if you guys can maybe introduce yourselves, tell us just kind of a little bit about your uh, background, how you got into Embedded, and uh, then we'll kick off with a, a group question from there. Sounds good. I'll kick us off. Um, yep, I'm Philip Johnston. I'm the founder of Embedded Artistry. And for those who don't know, we're an embedded systems consulting and education firm. I've been an embedded developer for almost 13 years now. And in that time, I've helped ship more than a dozen products. And I've worked in a number of industries, um, some of which include desktop software, consumer electronics, defense systems, manufacturing, robotics, and drones. Uh, my main interest nowadays is helping to bring embedded software development out of the dark ages. I feel like there are a lot of modern practices that embedded teams can benefit from that we don't take advantage of. And our main focus right now is sort of a three-pronged approach. We're trying to teach teams how to design systems to support change, which is particularly important um, in the days of the chip shortage, as well as how to build testable embedded systems, and perhaps most relevant for this conversation, how we can automate software quality enforcement processes. Cool. Um, I'll go next. 
Uh, I'm Tyler. I'm one of the co-founders of Memfault, which is, is the one that writes the Interrupt blog. Um, it is near and dear to my heart. I got started with Embedded when the CEO of Francois, um, sorry, the CEO of Memfault, Francois, hired me at Pebble. So I guess that was like eight years ago. I wrote firmware for Pebble. Um, Pebble got acquired by Fitbit. I worked with Shiva for about two, two and a half years um, at Fitbit, working on a bunch of smartwatch devices with him, and then left to join Memfault. Um, every firmware job I've had, I find myself doing developer productivity, um, improving tools, improving efficiency of all developers. I'm, you know, I'm a fan of firmware, but I don't really love the low level hardware sort of thing. I'm always finding myself in the higher levels of software, which is why I love to talk about metrics nowadays. So that's kind of my interest and that's who I am, Shiva. Hey, um, so I'm Shiva Rajagopal. I'm, a, um, I'm currently an embedded software engineer at Google on the Fitbit team. As Tyler mentioned, um, I've worked on every Fitbit smartwatch since uh, the Fitbit Ionic. I joined Fitbit back in 2016 and pretty much worked on low level hardware, all the stuff that Tyler doesn't like to do. Um, but we've uh, benefited a lot from each other's work. And um, I've also written a guest blog for Interrupt Once Upon a Time about Git Bisect. Um, and yeah, just really enjoy firmware and uh, embedded software and lighting up hardware. It's great. If only we all three worked together. <laughs> Perfect match. Jordan. So, well, I appreciate you guys running through the introductions. Uh, that definitely makes things easier. And I didn't even have to play walk off music for anyone. Uh, we're still on track and on schedule. So, um, really excited. So, let's go ahead and open up the conversation on metrics. Um, we're going to talk a little bit first about why metrics are valuable. Uh, and so, you know, maybe uh, it makes sense for Tyler for you to kick us off here for this uh, and to get us started on this conversation. But, you know, one of the things that I'm seeing is that chips are becoming more powerful and connectivity is better than it's ever been. And so, you know, the old world where collecting rich data from devices was kind of a pipe dream, um, you know, nowadays collecting data is the minimum requirement. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of different types of data you can collect. So, uh, would love to hear from you, you know, why are metrics valuable and what are people doing with metrics? Um, and then we'll open it up to, to everyone to add in some insights. Great. And you're going to restart, Jordan. Cool. Um, so I have seen, I mean, it was probably started a lot with Pebble. Um, I thought firmware was very basic software. You had really tight main loops. This is what I wrote in college. Um, you knew exactly how many CPU cycles you were using pretty much, depending on you know what type of system you were running. And then the Pebble smartwatch and probably other ones before <clears throat> then came along and now you're connecting to phones and you are connecting to Wi-Fi and you're doing really complex software. And now you have all of these bugs that you can no longer just reproduce at your desk. You know, you need this particular Android phone, you need this particular iOS phone or Wi-Fi router um, that you probably don't have on your desk. You can't reproduce it. And I believe one of the best ways I've found to just be able to even get an insight into what's happening on a device is using metrics. And so like Philip had alluded to, you're measuring how much time you are connected to Bluetooth or how much time you're connected to Wi-Fi. And even if you have that, you can very quickly assess whether this firmware update that you're building or whether you know your your updates that you're trying to build during, you know, leading up to launch, your Wi-Fi performance is improving or actually getting worse. Rather than just having the the really loud customer who has a really bad $10 Wi-Fi router from Amazon is the one that's like saying Wi-Fi doesn't work when you're pretty certain it actually does. Um, it gives you data to back yourself up on and your company and and when customers complain you know exactly what their data is looking like um that, that that's my like very basic metrics are important i'm sure you have other other things to add shiva and philip yeah, yeah. um one <laughs> sorry go ahead philip oh i just wanted to piggyback quickly off something um tyler mentioned which was the loud customer I think experienced product builders um, know how difficult it is to rely on customers to provide feedback because so few customers will. What ends up actually happening is you'll have 1% of your customers complain, even though 50% of your customers are having an issue, they're just not taking the time to report that issue to you. And 
when you have metrics in place, you're no longer relying on customers to give you that feedback. You can actually monitor the what's happening on devices and you know see that there are issues in the field that you might not even be hearing about. And I think that's a, that's an important capability we need to build. Yeah, and I'll add on to that with I think metrics can also help you check your assumptions about how your customers are using your product because. When you're building, say, a power model, you have expectations about how much each feature is going to be used by a customer in a given week or in a given day. And it may turn out that, hey, you know, they're flipping their wrists and they're checking their watch a lot more than you thought they would. And that's making it so you're not hitting your power numbers and people start complaining about that. So um, with metrics, you can kind of check yourself against that and see if you need to tweak your assumptions. I always thought it was funny when we started measuring, I think backlight time, LCD time, probably screen time at, at Fitbit as well. We were always a little scared and people were using their devices more because <laughs> yes, the power numbers would then, you know, your battery life would go down. We, um, I think specifically due to metrics at Pebble, we had, we had multiple settings for the LCD backlight. It was like three seconds, 10 seconds, a minute, and then like never turns off. And like, we ship that update to customers and immediately within like, you know, probably like two or three weeks, we're like, cannot have that feature. And so we like immediately like rolled that feature back. You could only set your backlight to like one, three and 10 seconds. And like, you couldn't keep it on forever. Um, we like removed that option entirely because it just obliterated battery life. But it wasn't like customers were really complaining loudly. It was like, oh, this is going to have an effect on us. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and then just basic stuff, like what we were saying, when customers don't call in to tell you there are problems, metrics can, like, again, metrics are just numbers that you're recording over a period of time. If you are just counting the number of successful flows or unsuccessful flows, or the number of times a product is used or feature is used, like, you can pretty easily tell whether a customer is having, having a rough time using their product or not even if it's as basic as like a coffee maker, if they're not making a cup of coffee like once a day, you probably know that that device isn't being used or it's broken on somebody's like, you know, in the trash can. Um, at least I made my cup of coffee today. And so my, my dumb product was a success this morning. Well, I think too, we can, you know, once we have the metric collection in place, it's nice to identify potential problems that are happening in the field, but we can also build more advanced capabilities. Like you can really improve your customer experience depending on what your device and your model is by, for example, monitoring devices and identifying those that need to have preventative maintenance done. Maybe you have a device whose battery looks to be failing based on characteristics that you can see. And so you're just going to preventatively ship them a new device so that you know, whatever system you've built that they're relying on in their store doesn't go down. You just, you know, whenever they leave for the day, they can swap out the device and not have a, a service outage, for example. Um, or even you could have automated metric checks. So you could do staged rollouts of your firmware updates, making sure that you don't release a bad update to everybody. If there's a problem, you're only gonna affect a minimal subset. So I think we can improve the customer experience too, once we have uh, these capabilities in place. Yeah, and to add on to that, I think um, it also lets you get a little bit ahead of the um, ahead of the curve when it comes to potential issues. Um, so, for example, if there's an issue that starts to happen and you start to see those metrics increase before customer service calls start to rise, you can kind of get in front of that and maybe start thinking about mitigations before it's just a complete fire. Oh man, I think that, that, that's slowly digging into our, when is the right time to start collecting metrics, which we'll leave to fill in a bit. But. <laughs> Before Jordan, we go to the topic, I, you know, I want to ask a question uh, kind of to all you guys, um, you know, Tyler, if you want to jump in, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, just sort of playing the, the role of the contrarian, uh, we have log files today and log files contain some metrics. Uh, we can derive metrics from those. Why, why is that different than, than collecting metrics uh, by themselves? Well, I'll take this one. Take yeah, I think the difficulty with log files is they're designed to be human readable and often it's to, to trace a sequence of events. Um, and so if you have a log file, certainly, and maybe this is an easy way to start with metric collection, you could print out some metrics to a log file at you know a periodic rate, but now you need a tool that's going to parse that out. And 
you're storing additional data that you might not want to store, the strings needed to, you know, print out a human readable format. And so, you know, we can, we can handle this data more efficiently if we have, for example, a numeric identifier and a numeric value. That's quite minimal compared to repeatedly printing out um, these text strings that are going to be encoded in our binaries. And then we're generating, you know, log files that are hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes that we need to send off where for post-processing. So we're just also complicating the process if we, if we try to do it that way versus build something that can read a number, graph the number, you know, evaluate some limits set on the number. I've, I personally find it a little easier to just work with numbers. Yeah, I found just trying to parse log files to be an absolute pain. And when somebody's like, oh, this log file has a misspelling or that it's grammatically incorrect. Let me add, you know, the missing E in here and then the log parser breaks. Like the amount of times that that's actually happened is like, you know, funny to be honest. Um, you're also using more cell data to send those logs. And most of the time, I guess I'm, I'm learning more of this just kind of a trend from the software world. Um, you use metrics to figure out if there is a core problem or there is a trending problem or if there is a problem with a population. And then you use log files once you know a few devices that you really want to dig into. And so I would, I would imagine that metrics are something you send up from all devices and collect from all devices. And then once you know there's a problem, then you, you know, ask a few customers or you, you, you ask a specific device, can I have your logs to like really get insight into what's actually happening? It's more of a... I need more detail. That's great. Um, I always need more detail and <laughs> there's always more detail to get. So I'm super excited. And, you know, you guys have convinced me I should start using metrics. We're going to go turn a bunch on right now. But, um, but Phil, let's be a little more realistic. Realist back in here. Uh, when is the right time to start using metrics? So we're all kind of at a different stage with our product and what we're doing. So you know, when should we start using metrics? When's the wrong time to use metrics? Um, and how do we, you know, get ourselves into that mode? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, the most common experience that I hear about team, hear from teams that I work with is, you know, they didn't even think of putting metric collection in place until they have, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of devices out in the field. And suddenly the marketing team or a VP comes and wants to know uh, which features are being most used and which are being the least used so they can prioritize the upcoming work. And the development team says, we, have, we don't know. We have no idea how to get that data. So then they spend months implementing some infrastructure and um, you know, they're delayed by, by you know, however long it takes to implement it and roll it out and then get valuable data from customers before they can make those business decisions. So if we wanna improve the state of the world, I would say the minimum way to improve it is you wanna have metric collection in place, at least for customer facing metrics before you ship your product. Now that's not that metric collection is the last feature you put in before you ship your product and then you hit the, the go button because it involves some you know capabilities on the device you need communication infrastructure you need some kind of server software that's going to be evaluating these metrics so there's a lot of complexity there that you need to work out like ota updates if you do it at the very end you're going to be in a world of hurt um, so in my ideal world it would actually be one of the first features that we would we would work on you know before you even start with application um, functionality or bringing up the various components that are going to work in your system I, I really like to start with the infrastructure components and test those out throughout the lifetime of the development cycle because we want them to be reliable. But also, if we have metric collection in place in the early days, we can start with metrics that perhaps we care about more as system developers or that help us monitor the health of our system, for lack of a better word. So, you know, these might be things that we care about as developers like boot time that our customers might not care about so much or might just be... Uh, you know, for them, it's just, is it, is it good enough or is it something that annoys me? Whereas we want to, we have a metric we're trying to hit. Or it could be average power consumption. Now, if you can track this on a per build basis throughout your development life cycle, it's easy to see when there are, when you've made a change and suddenly there's a, an instant spike going to a specific build version in boot time or power consumption or Wi-Fi radio on time or LCD on time or some other metric that you're looking out for. Well, your subset of changes you're searching through is much smaller. 
Whereas, you know, I think in my typical experience, when this has happened to me in the past, it'll be late in the development cycle. And suddenly, you know, like the VP of software will say, hey, uh, you know, I used to be able to use this device all day. And now I noticed I can only use it for two hours before I have to charge. What happened? Well, now I have three months of changes to go through to try to figure out what exactly happened to cut the battery life in half. Or I'm combing through the code and instrumenting it, trying to find out what exactly is, um, you know, taking all that power. And that's just going to be slower than if we had, you know, this monitoring in place throughout the lifetime of the, the product that we can um, take advantage of. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, going through a lot of historical data has got to be really tough. Uh, but, you know, I'll be the first to admit uh, I am not perfect. Um, and so, you know, what if I have already built a device, it's out in production, and we want to, you know, add metrics then? Are you telling me it's, it's too late? Or is, are there different considerations if, you know, we're sort of in that stage and, and working on sustaining a product? It's certainly not too late. And, you know, like I said, I think that's really the most common um, case I encounter. The only downside is just that you're taking time from developing features that your customers are going to care about to work on infrastructure that's not really going to impact your customers directly. And, you know, when your product's out in the field, personally, I just feel like, you know, you've shifted to a stage in the development process where you really want to improve the customer experience more than being you know, focused on infrastructure to support your own development. And so it's fine to add it in. Most people do add it in then. I don't think you lose out on anything by adding it in whenever you add it in, right? From that day forward, you're going to get much more data and you're going to be able to make better informed decisions. And that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit about making better business decisions because I think uh, metrics give us a lot of ability to do that. Um, but Shiva, I want to go over to you for a question now, and I want to hear from you a little bit uh, about, you know, what are the right metrics and what are the wrong metrics to start collecting? So when you're thinking about, you know, that early stage design, um, you know, what lessons have you learned over the years in terms of like, where do you start? Uh, what is the end goal? How do you scope that out? Um, there's a couple follow-ups I don't want to talk about with, you know, like the right and the wrong metrics, but I would love to just kind of get your thoughts on that first. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Philip kind of teed this up perfectly. Um, so especially in the early stages there, you know, you might not be caring about um, perhaps customer based metrics quite as much as much as you want to see, like, you know, the progress of development over time. But um, I personally think that, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about all of these things and kind of instrumenting those things um, into your code. Um, and that could be anything from, you know, something that you don't, you never expect to happen, but you want to log if it does versus, you know, something like, hey, you know, what are my power numbers looking like? How much are these things being used? And, you know, it's been kind of a common theme through my time and my career that, you know, sometimes the only reason that we implement a metric is because someone asked the question and the answer was, well, we don't know, we don't have the data. Um, and I, I think over the years, I've learned to sort of try and anticipate that. So whether that's something that, you know, maybe it's a higher cost thing in your product, right? You had to use a higher cost part or something to, you know, get the product out the door, but maybe you don't want to spend quite that much in the future, or maybe you want to, you know, open it up to different source suppliers or something like that. Can you, um, can you kind of go through that and say, okay, we have the metrics to say, yes, we can do this based on customer usage or no, we can't, we're kind of in a corner here. Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm rambling now, but, um, but yeah, anything Shiva, to add, Tyler, you, Philip? Shiva, you made a product that I think at Fitbit it removed multiple buttons. Did you, did you like add up all the numbers that you would have, that the users would on average click to like see if it met the button's lifespan? Um, not in terms of lifespan <laughs> actually, but we did use metrics to make that decision. Um, so the first couple smartwatches, the Ionic and the Versa had, um, had three buttons on them. And when the idea came along for the Versa Lite, which I was the lead on, they, they had the idea, what if we, can we remove the two right side buttons? And we had actually already instrumented the metrics to log how many times the button was clicked every hour. And once, once we were able to pull that data and aggregate it over all Ionic and Versa users, we were able to say like, hey, uh, you know, it's 
a third, a quarter, like people don't use those two buttons nearly as much. And that was at least part of the decision that factored into removing them. So, um, so that was one of those cases where we didn't really know, we didn't really have a use for that data until the question came along and thank goodness we had the data at that point. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome story. I, I do love that one. Um, I want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is making my own life easier. Um, so when you, you know, I'm hearing a lot about collecting metrics for, you know, customer use cases, solving customer problems. But I think in a lot of times, you know, a lot of what we do is uh, trying to make our own lives easier. So are there any metrics that you guys collect that, uh, you know, are not like customer facing metrics this is not something that tells you like customer health, but something that tells you kind of on the back end, you know, the own health of your device and, and what you're developing and feedback from your code. Do you guys have any metrics that are in that, that area? Some that immediately come to mind for me might be things like um, heap and stack high and low watermarks. Like how much memory is my device really using? Um, am I going to run into, you know, some kind of memory overflow scenario that I'm not realizing? It might be easier to detect those um, when you have this kind of data available. Similarly, you might have um, some metrics on file storage, like is your file system filling up and, and you're not quite aware of it? Um, maybe you want to track mutex lock failures to understand whether or not a lot of um, threading problems are happening in your system that are causing some inefficiencies that could be addressed if you change some logic or priorities. Um, maybe you're worried about, you know, how long your CPU is asleep in a given hour. So you can understand whether or not you can, um, you know, reduce the power consumption of your device by figuring out how to increase that time. I think there's a lot of, you know, developer focused metrics like that, that we can add that um, definitely help us out. Shiba, what other favorites do you have? Um, so some of my favorites tend to be in terms of sensor states. So let's say you have some environmental sensors, or maybe you have some control loop on the device that responds to the environment, and that can have power implications. It's sometimes helpful to know which state your sensor is in and how often across an aggregate population that sensor is in that specific state to you know kind of once again check your assumptions and see if things are actually working as they should. And, um, you know, kind of alluding to what uh, Philip was saying about power, there's some, like, your microcontroller is probably running pretty fast. And when it comes to switching power states, that can happen multiple times a second. And there's no way that you're going to be able to, you know, have a log message for each of those transitions, right? That's just going to blow out your power budget, blow out your logging budget. And but by using metrics, you can aggregate all that together and see the overall trends, right? Like, let's say the user did an action and all of a sudden we never went into low power again. That's, you know, a smoking gun for a bug report. And it can also just, you know, give you very useful information about what's going on with the product and what are the usage patterns and give your, um, you know, your maybe your battery dashboard some backing with data. Tyler, uh, do you have any thoughts that you want to add in? Next question's for you. And so I'm going to dig into all of your favorite metrics, but, um, <laughs> you know, what, you know, maybe like, do you have anything uh, for, you know, what are the right and wrong metrics? Do you have any top, maybe like vanity metrics or metrics that are useless that uh, you think people do collect before we go on to the next one? Um, I don't really have vanity metrics per se, but I will say that they change over time depending on the development cycle. And so towards the beginning, I'm probably going to measure what are the bounds of my hardware sensors reporting? Like, is this chip really bad? Does it take, you know, a second to operate or turn on when it's supposed to take a few milliseconds? Like I would be measuring some mins and maxes and averages of how long, you know, hardware takes to use. Um, I think the most important metrics are the ones that are really hard to reproduce at your desk. And, and again, that's related to like connectivity. How long is it taking to connect? What's my signal strength on my radios? How many disconnects do I have? Cause you can very easily correlate that to a release. Like this threading issue caused a tremendous <laughs> regression and Bluetooth time connected per hour. Um, you can use these the correlations if you're recording multiple metrics. And yeah, and then 
once the product is in, you know, probably post-production and you're done, I'd probably remove a lot of the hardware checks because you pretty much verified that they're all done. Um, except there's probably a few that you want to check around like how many times am I writing to flash? Am I going to burn through my flash chips over the course of six months? Because we almost did that at Pebble. Um, we rewrote our file system in a rush so that we wouldn't burn through a million flash chips um, and then have to replace most of them because they were going to be far past their life expectancy. Yeah, and I just want to echo what Tyler said, and I think it's a really important point. The most important metrics are the metrics you need right now, and the vanity metrics are the metrics that you don't actually need to make a decision that's going to benefit you right now. And I'll make an analogy to manufacturing tests because this is an area I have a lot of experience. Um, you know, a common need in manufacturing testing is to optimize test time because the longer it takes to test your devices, you know, it costs more money to produce that unit. And so you want to minimize, you want to maximize coverage while minimizing test time. Well, one of the easiest optimizations you can perform that I find teams have the highest resistance to is you turn off the tests that never fail. You turn off the tests that don't actually catch anything that's relevant for your unit anymore. And I think the same thing is true with metrics. Like you, you know, it's not that we're always expanding the number of metrics that are in our system until they take over um, our processing time. We're trying to collect the metrics we need right now. And if a metric isn't useful anymore, you can remove it because you can always add it back in later. And um, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and Tyler, I also kind of taken some stuff out of yours, you know, the idea mm -hmm. that uh, the best metrics to collect are the ones that are hard to recreate. And I, you know, such a simple idea, but, um, you know, I, I just, I know people that spend weeks and weeks trying to recreate issues and metrics. It'd just be much easier if they had them there. Uh, and that's, that's a good thought. So let's switch over to, you know, talking about minimum viable product for getting metrics up and running. So metrics are great. We want to turn them on and collect them all. Uh, but maybe we need to start early on in the process. Maybe we don't need the vanity metrics and we should figure out, you know, what is going to help us, um, you know, unlock our superpowers internally. And so can you maybe give us an idea of like, what is the minimum viable product for metrics? Uh, what does it look like and what does it eventually evolve into? Yeah, um, it, it's funny we get to this last as in like, we're talking about all these powerful things metrics can give you and then, you know, here's probably how you actually do it. Um, and I would, yeah, so I would start this as early as possible. It's building like this little micro metrics SDK framework library, whatever you want to call it. Um, Philip alluded to it earlier. I would keep an ID, which is the metric ID, and then I would store a number next to it. What we have found to work well is to basically keep metrics and aggregate them over the course of an hour. You know, this library is something I, I could even ask in like, you know, a coding interview for, for a firmware job. Like let's write a C-based RAM buffer that, that allows you to increment metrics by an ID. Um, very simple library. And so over the course of the hour, you're counting the number of flash writes you've had over the hour. You're counting the amount of time you're connected over Bluetooth. You're, connect, you're counting the number of mutex, mutex failures. Like once you build the library, which is probably no more than like 50 lines of code, I think I've built like two or three in my past. Um, one for an interrupt blog, so that can show you how much time it probably took me to write the library. Um, and then you have a, time, uh, a timer callback for every hour that like, once that hour is done, scoop up the metrics and put them somewhere. And the MVP, and this is when you're, what you're doing at the very beginning of your development stages, is just dump that to the console. Um, if your UART or, or your USB is connected, now you have them on your terminal. You can run the device overnight and you can like wake up the next morning and see what metrics your device had been experiencing overnight. Um, if you're seeing like really bad numbers, even through your one, one or two devices on your desk, like that's, that's the start. Um, and then I think it just gets creative from there. Like, I think what I would probably do is then take that RAM buffer, you know, put it in, you know, format it in a really poor CSV and, and send that over the data pipe somewhere. And that is probably connecting to a Wi-Fi router or an endpoint, uh, probably unprotected at that point um, and getting the data out. And then you've 
eventually realize CSV is too large and then you write some sort of like CPACT struct based thing or protobuf. But all of these like complexities um, make it much more difficult to even design a thing um, the first time around. So if you're trying to design a metric system, like once it's in production, you can't just send a bunch of like really large CSV files over the data pipe after the fact. You need to build the optimized solution. So yeah, start simple, start over the UART, start sending, even dump them into your log files that then you can pull later on if you already have a logging system. Um, okay. So that was the MVP. And then what does the perfect solution look like? This is honestly what, we've, we're, we're, what we are working on at Memfault. Um, the perfect solution is something that allows you to bucket your metrics by time, by software version, and by device. <clears throat> and what that allows you to do is easily spot regress regressions, um, either on a per device or like a per software or, or even time basis. And so if you're deploying firmware 1.0 and you've just updated it, you've worked really hard, three months coming, you're working on your 2.0 and you think everything is fixed. You, you push that onto even a few devices, maybe internally, and you start collecting metrics and you can immediately spot that your Bluetooth performance has gone down. The, you know, the number of mutex lock failures has gone up. The, the heap free is now like really encroaching in on, on having a like, you know, memory overflow, you're going to run out of RAM. Um, but that's just like, even with a few devices, and that is what we had at Pebble, like we could estimate battery life expectancy from 10 devices. And I think about like six hours worth of data. It gave us a pretty good insight into how long our battery life was going to last. Um, and I remember like our biggest fires at Pebble were one, break firmware update, two, break analytics, and three was like, the watch can't tell time anymore. We were like, eh, like people can get by without the watch telling time, but we can't get by without like not knowing what's actually going on on devices or whether like all of them are brick. It was more of a business risk decision. All right, I'll let you speak a little bit, Jordan, if you have questions, but that is my like spiel. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I want to I want to hear everyone kind of chime in uh, and see, you know, what all there is to say. Um, I, I think uh, I have probably a couple follow up questions around sort of that end product and or even maybe, you know, starting off with like the beginning stages of like hardware versus software metrics. Um, like, you know, where do you start and what is like the end goal? What are the different types of metrics you're collecting, you know, at that perfect state? Like, how do you refine those might be interesting to hear about. Philip, you got anything? Well, I just want to say that um, for your MVP solution, I wrote down like almost word for word, the same kind of flow. So, you know, <laughs> in that, I definitely agree. And in the ideal, I mean, for me, why would you build your own if you could find a solution that already did everything you need in an optimized way? Because what your company's trying to do fundamentally is build a product, not build a, a analytics solution, right? Um, so if you could find something that works for your, your team that you could drop in, um, you know, that's a big win in savings wise, a big win, like time and money wise, you're not spending developer time on it, you're not taking time away from valuable feature development, um, you know, to do this supporting infrastructure work. Um, so to me, the ideal solution is just something I can add to my product and, you know, be ready to go. Yeah, awesome. And Tyler, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. I was rereading uh, your blog, the interrupt blog post on metrics the other day, and just kind of got me thinking around like, okay, so there are some metrics that you would collect and you want to know like battery voltage, that is a single mm -hmm. metric, but maybe you want to calculate something a little more advanced. Um, so your, your minimum viable product is collecting voltage, uh, but ultimately you want to be able to predict things. So how do you use metrics to predict and, uh, you know, get to other numbers, um, aggregate metrics, or you know, future calculations. Yeah, there. That's a great question. I mean, there there are two ways to I think calculate the the kind of like in gold metric that you want um, with millivolts and and battery life. What I like to do is actually measure the delta between the the start of the hour and the end of the hour. And so, if you're trying to calculate. Um, battery life expectancy. What would be really hard is if you just had every single of your million devices report their battery life, like 47% or 3000 millivolt. And then you have to do some incredibly complex cal calculations 
on a server or or yourself on your Python scripts because now you're having to track, sorry, street cleaner. You're having to track um, every single device's data points. If you then measured the delta, so my device dropped from 90% to 80% in the course of an hour, now your stat just says it's gonna drop 10% per hour. You take all of those across all devices. Oh, cool, the average drop per hour is 8%. Now I can like very quickly do in a calculation that is like my battery life will be, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a calculation there. Um, and same sort of thing if you're trying to calculate the deltas of certain things. Um, I think that's probably the simplest one there. And then if you're trying to do large scale calculations, the, the reason we suggest and then pull and kind of push for it is the hourly heartbeat is it's much easier to calculate on the server or in a database or in your scripts, rather than if you're saying over the entire course of the device's lifespan, I have written this many times to flash. And then you basically have to do a bunch of subtractions for all of the previous metrics that you've ever had on that entire device um, and then aggregate them. Just record the number of times this thing happened in an hour and it's a pretty easy aggregation. Now, when and, you're, uh, sorry, go ahead. I just have a question. Yeah, when you're um, collecting these deltas, are you only looking at the deltas, or is there also like you know my device turns on and checks in, and then you might get the current starting battery voltage and the starting state of charge and calculating deltas from that, or you're only focused on deltas? Got it. Um, there, I guess yeah, you're probably capturing a few different types of things. I would personally capture um, different use cases. I would personally capture the battery delta, and then I would also capture the current battery state as well. And because you know the perfect metric solution, which which Memfault does this, is it gives you this sort of aggregate view and aggregate metric across all of your devices. But then you can hone in on one device and see its metrics over time. And so you can very easily then see like this device's battery goes from 90 to 80 to 70 to 60 to 50, and you have it over a very nice graph. And so you do you want to know how many times the thing happened, but you also probably want to know the actual state. And so like, you know, the stack high watermark is kind of like in the metrics world, it's kind of called a gauge. It's like, what is my speedometer at this exact moment in time? And you're just going to capture that at the end of the hour. Um, but you're also probably going wanting to calculate or, or at least keep track of how many allocations and what was the largest allocation over time as well. Shiva, you were cutting in, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to, you know, make a higher level point to what you both are saying. Um, so I think there's a happy medium to be struck with the metrics that you uh, calculate on your device and send up, as well as how frequently it happens. Because, you know, you can do a whole bunch of calculation and derive metrics on the device and send them up. But there's a point at which that, you know, starts to take more time on your device. And, you know, you could very easily just pull the data later and, you know, do kind of a post calculation. Same with temporality. You can, you know, it's, I think the, the hour long window is the perfect like balance of, you know, how things need to go because you log too frequently, you're going to, you know, fill up, you're going to be uploading more data, but you kind of lose the detail if you go higher than that. So, you know, when you're making a system, I think it really helps to consider those two things. So like battery delta, lightweight calculation, you can pretty easily send that up as well as the raw metrics that it was derived from but maybe something like, oh yeah, you know, in this charge cycle, how many days did I last? I mean, that assumes that you have a good sense of time on your device as well. <laughs> so may not end up be worth it, being worth it. So that's that's all I wanted to say on that. Yeah, that's good. And you know, in the embedded world, uh, there's just nothing but limits to our resources. Um, and so, you know, whether it's bandwidth or, or power, um, you know, you always have to decide what to send up, right? So great point uh, and kind of transitioning to our next topic um, of privacy and security. Now metrics are just numbers uh, and metadata. So obviously there's no privacy and security concerns, um, but really uh, tell us, you know, what are the things that people should be thinking about uh, when you decide what to send, what not to send, uh, when you think about what type of data is, you know, captured within metrics, um, you know, would love to hear from you guys on, uh, and again, just as a, a friendly reminder to uh, the, the attendees, uh, I feel like there's a lot of questions here, so feel free to type them in as we're continuing to go along, um, but I'm going to open it up to the panelists. Uh, tell me a little bit about privacy and security. What are the concerns people should care about? What's top of mind? And, and let's dig in. 
Yeah. We'll one... start. Go, Go ahead. Philip. No, nope, <laughs> okay. Philip, you're up. All right. I was just going to say that, you know, it's 2022 and I think table stakes for building a connected device is you need to have secured, cryptographically secured connections. You need to be paying attention to basic security hygiene, no default passwords on your devices. Um, you know, there's a number of security standards you can follow and that it doesn't just apply to metric collection. It's not like metric collection is you know, in itself a security risk for your product. It's just another, you know, often it's piggybacking on existing communications that are already in place. And those communications do need to be secured. You know, it's, even if we don't view it as harmful, I just don't think it's a, a good assumption nowadays that what you should be doing is sending plain text data over a network. And on top of that, like Jordan said, often metrics are just numbers, some numbers, certainly have bigger privacy concerns than others. If you give me a, you know, a certain accelerometer data, I can track how you're moving through the world. But that's not a metric that we need to collect um, to understand how our devices are being managed. And you know, I would say metrics are also not typically personally identifiable because a lot of that information is going to be configuration data. And that's not something that you should be uploading as part of your, your metrics. You don't need to know the Wi-Fi SSID and you know different passwords or whatever else that is connected to a user. That's not a metric that's gonna help you gain insight into how your device is behaving. Um, so in some sense, it's like practice basic security hygiene and don't send data that's gonna compromise your user are, are sort of fundamental ideas there. Although, you know, I think we can build upon those because certainly we can poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. I so a couple things, a couple things there. Yes, all for securing and like encrypting all traffic. I will also stress that if you're doing internal testing or you're before production, like build what works for you. Like yes. you don't really care about I mean, kind of what just don't include metrics that would actually care about your employees, but like your employee data, the ones, you know, how they're using the product, like they're using your product because they're trying to stress test it. It's fine if that's not secure. And so don't, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, especially when it becomes to internal testing. Um, and I think I had a second point, but I totally forgot it. And, and I'll just add on um, while you try and remember your second point, Tyler, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to um, to real world sensors, like Philip was saying about accelerometers, um, you know, a lot of devices have GPS these days. And there's, you know, especially when you're running in a small device or a power constrained environment, GPS tends to be really, really difficult. And, you know, I think it's really helpful to have a lot of information about how your GPS chip is working. Um, but that can also leak a lot of information that people consider to be sensitive generally, I guess people like their location to be somewhat controlled and how it's shared. So, um, so yeah, when it comes to that kind of stuff, I think, you know, that's where you want to do some of the, uh, you know, peer metrics and not just, you know, send as much data up as you can and maybe even anonymize it across an aggregate if, um, if that works. Yeah, I, I remembered, remembered it, anonymizing it. Um, if you're trying to record the SSID or that would help you, like if there is one user that bounces between three SSIDs and they always call you having a complaint, like record the last three letters of the SSID or take a hash of the SSID and so that you can realize, oh, this person's on this network, that's when they have the problem. And then on the other two, there are no issues. It's kind of like recording the last four digits of your like, credit card. Like, it's not private information, really, it only if you send the whole thing up. Um, so like SSID um, and other, other sort of strings like that, like you can encode that into four ASCII characters and send that up as a metric and kind of do some decoding on the back end. And, you know, I think we shouldn't forget that if we're worried about um, the metrics we're collecting being a privacy concern, we can always have users opt in. We could have a beta testing population, like a requirement to be a beta tester is you have to agree to send metrics up. Um, you might have metrics binned into different categories, one of which is system metrics that you believe do not um, violate any privacy concerns and others that um, may be more questionable that users can opt into those additional metrics. So I think there's also, you know, you, you can give the user some choice. And of course, you're gonna lose out on some data. Um, but that's the trade-off we make. Yeah. 
Yeah. Great. I appreciate that, guys. So going into another group of some questions, you know, I want to hear maybe even some uh, kind of rapid fire. I, I might point on you guys for some of these. So these are some of the audience questions that I like, um, and we're we're still gathering some of those. Um, so you know, I saw a couple questions come in uh, about connectivity, uh, and I think there were two or three different ways this got asked. Um, some beforehand and some, you know, during the chat today. But uh, Tyler, I'll, I'll send this one to you first, uh, which is like, if your device is having connectivity issues, how do you grab metrics uh, for that? Um, and then, you know, likewise, I mean, if your device, well, I'll save the follow up, but let's start there. Got it. Um, definitely stay, save your metrics to persistent storage. I mean, I'm saving all of my metrics in a RAM buffer, and then I basically flush that RAM buffer somewhere. And I think at Pebble, we were able to batch up maybe like a week's worth of analytics data on Flash. It was one of our largest regions of Flash. And then once you eventually have connectivity or the user sends that device back to you, you can then, you know, connect a debugger to it or whatever, and then probably pull a decent amount of metrics off since you're saving all those and persisting them. But yeah, I mean, if you can't send data, you just can't send data, but you can retrieve it otherwise. And maybe you could add a metric too. That's like how many attempts you made to send the data before it <laughs> failed. <laughs> um, yeah. So you can determine, you know, whether or not you're running into that problem. Yeah, very good point. Uh, attempts, requests, errors, durations, uh, all very useful for, for diagnosing issues. Um, Phil, I'll send this one to you, uh, which is going to be, uh, do you have some, like, is there a uh, best practices, like a metric library, standard library examples, um, you know, just sort of in the industry, do you see any like kind of best practices that you would point people towards? Is the industry agreeing on metric formats uh, or anything in that regard? Well, I tend to see two things nowadays. One is people using memfault and two is um, people rolling their own solutions, usually with some kind of you know, piggybacking off some kind of key value store or an internal database that already exists on the product. Um, um, libraries are escaping me at the moment, but often they're just, you know, like somebody has a key value store for configuration data, and then they also add analytics data. And then, you know, whatever message they're sending with their device check-ins or, you know, to talk to their IoT backend, they're just going to read from that key value store, send them up and reset it. So I typically see one of those, those two approaches. As far as a standard, it's like other than a solution like Memfaults, no, I don't really see anything standardized out there. You, you can't remember the names of these libraries because you probably shouldn't use them, honestly, because I think there was a question here in the chat. It's like, should I instrument my bootloader? Should I instrument other things? Like if you're gonna instrument something super critical like your bootloader, which honestly, I, I could suggest it, you need to know exactly every single bit of code that's running in there and you can't use a random library that you find on the internet and like yeah they're open source ones i'm not disregarding that but like in this also should just be incredibly simple like you can write a simple library that won't break if you unit test it then you can use it everywhere and then you can just read from ram on the other end as well well just touching on the bootloader real quick i would say if you were going to add metrics to your bootloader the way I would approach it would be you can collect collect the metrics, but then you're just passing them up to the application to actually get saved into whatever solution you're using. You're not having the bootloader itself manage Flash and uh, analytics library because all you're doing there is increasing the size and complexity of the bootloader and giving it more reasons to fail that are outside of its core responsibility. Yeah, perfect. It, as a follow up, Shiv, I'm throwing this one to you. Um, there was a question uh, that kind of piggybacks off of this, which is uh, like, how much complexity does adding metrics add to your firmware? So you've designed your firmware, you're thinking everything looks beautiful and great. This is a piece of art, um, but I forgot to add metrics. So you go back in, is that going to introduce a ton of extra complexity? Is there a chance it reduces the complexity? Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, so I think if you're if you instrument your metrics in a well thought out way, it shouldn't add that much complexity to your product. It should just kind of be as your code is doing the things that it's already doing. It's just collecting some data along the way. And, you know, that can be as quickly as let's say I just want to get an average min max for something that's happening in my system. All I need to do is, you know, 
every time I want to grab a metric over the course of an hour, I, you know, add it to a large, you know, integer for a sum and I see if it's larger than my max or less than my minimum. And then at the end of the hour, I divide by how many measurements I've got and boom, that's it. it and, you know, as long as you've thought out how you're going to flush that out to persistent storage and, you know, hopefully that doesn't take too long, it really shouldn't add too much complexity onto your code. But I will reemphasize the point. It really helps to think it out in advance rather than just, you know, throwing it in and not really thinking about how it needs to scale. Because if you don't think about that from the outset, you might find yourself taking way too much room or, you know, maybe actually adding on to how much time your code takes on the whole. Yeah, that that makes sense. And, you know, sort of in line with complexity as well. Um, I'll open this up to the group. Uh, a question from the chat is a little bit about what if you have devices that are performing maybe like the same function, but at very different intervals. So what if we have like a device that uh, the way I interpret this question is um, maybe we have a some sort of device with an actuator that, you know, works like uh, once a day versus something that works a million times a day. So similar piece of device, uh, but maybe they're operating differently um, in the setting. You know, how might we think of metrics differently for those, you know, like high activity devices versus low activity devices? Yeah, I have a comment. The, the, so we, we've been talking about hourly heartbeats. What you could do in a lot of these cases, if you just want to measure like the amount of time something is running is when you send up your like, we call it like a metric summary or heartbeat. You can send the amount of time that device was running over that course of the heartbeat. And so if the device was only running for four seconds, I guess you could record metrics for four seconds. You know what to divide all these metrics by if you need an average, you know, if you're trying to basically baseline it on a second. Um, that's mostly what I have there, I would say. That's tough. Is that in the Q and A, Jordan? Um, yes, uh, I was curious uh, if anybody else has any comments and then I'm going to make a couple housekeeping announcements since we are close to our time. Um, so I know we still do have some questions coming in. Uh, we, uh, if anybody has any hard stops, um, you know, out attending, feel free to shoot us a note. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we are going to uh, send out the unanswered questions through the interrupt community Slack channel. Uh, so please feel free to join and get on that. Um, for some of those, uh, that information, we're going to send out an email with uh, the panelists' information, a uh, recording of today's presentation, uh, and a few other resources that we mentioned here that might be useful for you guys. Um, of course, I'd always like to, to shout out that Memfault is hiring a firmware solutions engineer. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in helping embedded engineers solve the most complex problem in the world, then, you know, uh, come join the team. Um, but like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, all this is on the interrupt Slack going to be posted later. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining, uh, everyone who attended. We really loved having you guys here and answering some of your questions live. We are going to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes or so, or however long we can convince these guys to keep answering questions. Um, so thanks for, every, for joining everyone. Uh, we'll stay on and, and casually answer a few more questions from here, uh, but definitely want to thank you for your time so far. Um, great. Are there any questions that you guys see in the chat that uh, we definitely want to answer that you guys want to uh, comment on? Uh, let's take the one about devices not having network access and how we can collect metrics. I think there's, you know, one answer to that question is you need some way to talk to your device to get the metrics off your device. It's really hard to get around that. So if you're, you know, if you have devices in the field and you can't create a way to get the data off the device, you just kind of have to live with it. And maybe in that case, you know, you're using metrics in a controlled environment that, um, you know, you manage, so you can access those devices. It might be that you're, you know, you're running a beta test where you can collect devices at the end of it to, to see how they're performing, or you have a lab of hardware devices that are running automated tests or, you know, checking new firmware versions that, that you can collect them and, and get the metrics off via some kind of wired communication. So that might be one solution. And another solution that comes to mind is, you know, there are, it's like maybe 
you don't have a network connection, but there you're servicing devices occasionally in the field by you know having a tech go out and plug them in, or um, you have some kind of update software that the user plugs their device in and the update runs. Maybe that software can collect the metrics off, or you know the tech who's updating the devices or servicing them can get the metrics at that time. Um, of course, you have to pay attention to what you're collecting and how much data you can keep between those events. Um, so you're still not necessarily going to get as much data as you would with a regular network connection. But I think such things are still possible. And you can, you know, it's like some kind of wired connection, a UART shell command, a nano PB call that, that um, gets metrics. Any number of techniques can be used to, to get the data off the device in that situation. And I'll add on, you know, don't discount how much information you can get without knowing the actual, you know, GMT time. Um, you know, if you're, if all you have is a monotonic counter of time since boot, you can still get some pretty valuable metrics just over time. And, you know, maybe your once an hour heartbeat, as long as you have some notion of time that you can rely on, you can still get some pretty useful things about how the device is behaving, even if you don't know, you know, what actual time it is. And even if you can't get, you know, the metrics off the device, you know, over the year, if it's something that you can manage and check in on in person now and then, you can still do a lot. Yeah, and if you needed to really differentiate between like, like all you have is a monotonic time since boot, you could create a boot counter that gets incremented every boot and use that plus the monotonic time as a way to differentiate, um, you know, metrics over time, even though you don't have an exact timestamp. Have you used boot counters in the past, Philip? You've implemented them? Nope. Okay, cool. I just thought I was of curious, that. actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, some, it's, something, it's something that I think I've always wanted to do, but still not yet done a boot counter to associate, you know, all these metrics go to this boot, uh, individual boot, basically. I would say the like the closest boot count thing I've done is the number of panics that have occurred since the last successful boot or check-in or, you know, something like that. That's probably the closest thing. Got it. Um, I, yeah. I kind of hear ahead, from sorry. you guys, uh, this is not a panel question, but like, I want to know, uh, maybe, like, what's the, one of the weirdest devices you've ever worked on um, that you had to maybe create some metrics for and you had some just like weird, bizarre metrics? I just, I just want to hear you guys go through, you know, some weird stories if you have one really quick uh, to spark some interest. You all know what devices I worked on, Pebble and Fitbit. So nothing, nothing fancy there. I just think one of the, just a short, one of the most convoluted systems we worked on was just like we had a main chip and a Bluetooth chip. And like, I think step number one was like get some sort of transport to work. Step number two was getting the analytics to flow between these two chips. And then afterwards we were like, now let's get the Bluetooth working. Because we knew that like we can't assess whether the Bluetooth is actually working without some sort of metrics, like calculating how much time is actually connected. But that was like a long running project. Um, but that was the only weird thing, I guess. Philip, you probably had some weird projects. I can't think of anything like weird and metric related. Perhaps the most non-standard use of metrics I can think of was uh, I had I know of a company that was building a device and they needed to make a release and they didn't have time to get the charging circuitry for their battery um, in place. And so they put in lithium batteries in their device and their solution was literally to use the analytics to see when the battery dropped below mm. a certain state of charge. And then they would <laughs> go to the, the customer site and replace all the units. And then, um, you know, once they had gotten their charging circuitry FCC approved and everything, they they did the same thing and swapped out all the older units with the, with the updated circuitry. So I thought that was a pretty clever way to manage the problem um, while still meeting the like deadlines that were necessary for their contracts. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing too yeah, funky and weird that I can think of. I appreciate that. I feel like um, in the current job market, there's a lot of people jumping into projects that maybe they didn't design and they're looking at, you know, some of these devices like, oh my gosh, like what, what should I even be doing with this thing? And so uh, maybe one of the things we'll, we'll close on is a question that was asked like a bunch of times beforehand and then even today in the chat, which is like, let's consolidate on best practices of metrics. What are the metrics that you guys all agree on that we should be collecting at a minimum? Um, you know, when looking at, uh, I did a lot of work on like cloud web servers and we talk about red metrics, 
requests errors and duration, and that should help us debug and troubleshoot most issues. With an embedded uh, you know, space, there's just a lot of uh, you know, things to think about. So um, I'm curious to sort of get your guys' opinions definitively sort of at the end of this panel, what are the metrics that we all need to be collecting? I think at the top level, you're measuring where your resources are going. And those resources are, you know, hardware lifespan, your time is in CPU time, where is your memory going, where is your flash space going. Um, and then the softer one is kind of like, well, it's not really related, but like connectivity, like where is my connectivity time going, is it connected or is it not connected. Um, for firmware developers, the easiest ones, everyone should track them is like, where are all my resources going. Um, I do like heap, I like stack usage. Um, CPU time, task time, and, and counting the number of errors, failures of timeouts. Um, if, you're, if you're not actually rebooting on asserts, how many asserts were actually triggered? Um, and then going really quickly back to alluding to what Jordan just said, like I'm given this gnarly code base, what do I do with it and how do I figure out what's happening? Like you can instrument the code with metrics and it's like, how many times is this thing actually called and used? You can add a metric to that. And, and that's kind of how you gain insight to a really weird code base that you've never seen before and how it's actually being used. Um, you may want to remove it, but now you realize it's being called a million times a, you know, a minute and you're like, well, I'm not going to remove that again. So. It's cool. I love that. Um, I'm going to recommend that we write a blog post about stepping into a troublesome code base and what to do. I, you know, that sounds very useful. We have a list, Jordan. I'll, I'll, I'll add it. To the <laughs> um, and and I'll add on to the to the list of metrics real quick. Um, you know, usually in an embedded system, you've got some level of peripherals attached, and sometimes those peripherals have metrics of their own. So, for example, if you're using EMMC, usually EMMC has an internal state of how much it's worn down, and if you you know you can use that on the device, but it's sometimes good to get an aggregate view of like. Hey, is this thing wearing out faster than I expected it to? So don't don't count that out. Um, a couple other uh, rapid fire follow up questions uh, that we got from the chat. So uh, one person asks: In addition to collecting metrics, it's equally important to timestamp them, uh, mm -hmm. making you know I guess time series metrics out of this. One of the things that they comment is that you know with IoT devices, uh, there's always the chance to reference real world clock, um, which, you know, I would say there are some devices maybe that aren't ever connected that don't really know a whole lot about time. So can you comment on time stamping metrics when you should and shouldn't? Shiva, you talked about this previously, right? Or like, you want to yeah. expand on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think it's very important to have a real world clock when you can, but you know, like I said, it's not the end of the world if you don't have a real world clock. Um, so I, yeah, I guess it's kind of a, if you think that it's important to have real world clock, then you should probably find some way of getting it. But otherwise, I think you can do quite a bit with a monotonic time since boot. And, um, you know, like, uh, like Tyler mentioned earlier, the idea of having some level of persistent storage that you can go in and pull the data from later, at least if there's some level of relative time there, then I think that's, you know, that's the best you're going to be able to do. And sometimes that's good enough. And even if you don't have a connection to where you can continually sync your RTC, I mean, that doesn't mean that your non-connected device can't have one and you can't set that time during, you know, your manufacturing process or during a provisioning process. Like there are still ways to initialize a real-time clock that don't require network connections. Yeah. The, the follow-up on this that uh, I, I didn't quite see or ask is, is there a stand, uh, is there a good way to achieve this when a device loses real world time after a reset? Uh, so maybe are there yeah. special considerations to think about or something there? Sometimes people have a separate battery backup for their RTC. That's just a mitigation. But I think, you know, we touched on this before, uh, a monotonic timestamp with a boot counter is a pretty simple way to, to, um, differentiate the different sets of metrics. Awesome. And uh, another follow-up uh, here is, is there a standard format used for storing metrics? Also got a question on uh, visualizing, displaying, 
database uh, things. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Um, are there standard formats? Uh, how should people be thinking about that? I don't think there is a standard. I mean, out, like, uh, you know, outside of Memfault, I would say no. The, um, I know many of these RTOS frameworks um, are generally coming up with a format that will probably become some form of a standardized thing. Um, people are using Protobuf and they are using Seabor and Message Pack, I believe are the three that people will use to basically like serialize them into a more compact state. Um, and if you look in the cloud world uh, and software, people are using things called Open Telemetry, StatsD, um, Prometheus. If you just want to like keyword search those, you can find some like really good information on basically how to track metrics and what they're thinking about. But in terms of the embedded space, there's not really a standardized format. And in terms of visualizing, they are just numbers and they're generally based on time. And so, yeah, just like Excel, <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah, so a follow-up on that was asked, um, I mean, can you get by with looking at plain numbers matrix style? Uh, can you can you get by with that? I would say no. The, the beauty of metrics, especially on the per device sort of time frame, is that you can see correlations between the two. It's like, oh, my battery life started to drop really quickly, and my accelerometer never turned off after this point. Like, you're not going to really see that if you're just looking at numbers. I mean, maybe maybe if you read the matrix, but probably not. And if you just have yeah. numbers or a CSV or something, I do think you could probably write, you know, an R script or I don't. There's a number of uh, Python libraries for plotting, or you know, drop it into MATLAB and and analyze the data that way too. Certainly not as simple as having something like a dashboard from Memfault that you know shows your metrics graphed over time, but um, it is still possible. Just you know, yeah. now requires you to to implement something to parse all that data. Yeah, I'd say anything's possible to do manually. The question is, do you actually want to? And right. usually, the answer is no. For sure. I, okay, go ahead, Tyler. Well, I had one last comment on the previous question: timestamps. If you're doing aggregates across all your devices, they don't matter. If especially if you're keeping mm -hmm. an hourly time window, if every device is capturing it hourly. Timestamps literally don't matter, generally, um, unless you're trying to find out if there is an environmental issue, like, oh, iOS got updated on this particular day. That's why all of my metrics went south or north. Like, that is super useful when you have a timestamp. But if you're just trying to figure out what is the software stability, timestamps don't matter. If you're trying to look at an individual device, exact timestamps don't really matter, but rough timestamps matter. Like, you want to know that these seven metric, you know, heartbeats are after these other ones. Um, but you don't need to know exact timestamps. Got it. And, you know, Tyler's still thinking about timestamps and I love that about <sighs> you. And, and that's, that's great. I, I can imagine in 20 minutes, you're, you're going to have more thoughts on it too, but um, I know. Sorry, so in, in closing, we're getting close to the end here, but I want to give the three of you guys a bit of a platform just to maybe like mention something here at the end for anybody else. Uh, like most of the viewers are, are still on. So like, I, I would love to hear like, is there a special project you're working on really excited about? Is there something in the industry that you guys want to mention, draw attention to that you either think is really cool, people should check out, uh, something that is on your radar that you want to maybe plug here for a quick minute? Um, you want to take I it away, Shiva? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, other than the obvious, you know, very excited about Memfall, watching everything y'all are doing. Um, I, I have a, you know, I, I joined Google as part of the Fitbit acquisition a little over a year ago, and there are some pretty cool open source projects that I'm seeing around here. Um, in the embedded space, one that I'm seeing is called Pigweed. And basically, they're trying to assemble a whole bunch of, you know, kind of modules that you can assemble yourself that kind of, you know, it's, it's an implementation that just works out of the box. It's written in C++, um, and I'd recommend giving it a look. I've, I've had a lot of fun just playing around with it and um, you know seeing how people internally to Google are using it to piece together um, some systems. Philip? Um, I mean, I'll echo the, I'm a fan of Memfault, and I think they're doing great work. Um, so you guys keep that up. Um, as far as interesting projects, you know, I've also recently been playing around with pigweed. So that's, uh, it's funny that you mention it. Um, 
Pico libc, which came up in the interrupt Slack. I really like that as an alternative to new lib. Um, and of course, how could we all not think about how great Zephyr is? And then as far as what I'm working on, um, right now my main focus is designing embedded software for change. So I, I'm developing a course that um, you know I'm regularly publishing new content to. And then if you have any challenges with you know dealing with swapping out new chips or responding to changes in customer requests or you know other change related problems, I'd love to hear from you to you know see if I'm addressing those problems or even come up with with a way to help your you and your team manage that. Cool. My biggest challenge at Memfault. I guess for the firmware community is just education and that is through the interrupt blog. And so my, my pitch is if any of you want to write or explore topics on what we can write about on interrupt, join us in the interrupt Slack um, or reach out to me, Tyler at Memfault. Um, we can get you either writing or contributing to interrupt in some way. Yeah, if you're hearing this, uh, definitely get engaged with the interrupt community, uh, you know, we'd love to have you there. Definitely very active. Um, so I want to take a minute to thank the three of you, you guys, I thought this was a great discussion uh, for everyone out there. We are planning to do these quarterly. Uh, we're looking for topics, ideas, things that are top of mind, would love feedback as you close out of the Zoom. I believe there's going to be a uh, link to, to let you give some feedback and take a short survey. We'd love to know kind of what you thought about it um, and, and what we can do better to keep enabling the embedded community.